I decided to live in the gift economy myself. And I did that in a country like uh, I live in France, and probably one of the, of the toughest countries in the world to go into gift economy because the French don't have a culture for that because they consider that the state, the nation state, should take in charge social solidarity. Even if, if you go to a restaurant, you don't give a tip because you already have 15% embedded in the price. So the tip already got given to the waiters, uh, the service. So the French don't know much about uh, social solidarity. They don't go into situations where they have to evaluate by themselves what and how much, if we speak about money, of course, how much they have to, to give. And um, I work a lot with global companies. And those global companies, you know, they have some CEOs and those global companies ask real questions about how could we evolve and how our organization can evolve. And they call me to explore that and to support them and to go into long-term strategies with the, those global companies. Um, but then I tell them, okay, we'll do it, uh, but we'll do it in the gift economy thing. What? <laughs> they don't really know about gift economy. And I've done that for the past five years and a half now. And the first two years, really, um, I really started struggling, mostly because I didn't have a language for gift economy. We have 500 words to talk about the market economy, but we have less than 10 words to talk about the gift economy. Because we talk about, you know, kind of nice words, you know, like gift and become kind to one another. But actually, as a social system, a gift economy has much more potential and much more complexity than market economy. And let me explain why and why I went there and also open the conversation for Oroville here. When we operate in small settings like the jazz band, a sports team, or with, with friends, or in a family, any small community, we don't need a currency. <coughs> And therefore, we don't need money because we naturally operate in the gift economy. That means I give what I can give if someone asks me, and I ask for things, and I may receive them if someone can give them or if the community can give that to me, okay? So we just give and receive, but it doesn't have to play in a reciprocal way. Whereas in market, in market economy, I'll give you something only if you have something reciprocal to give me, either through barter, like I give you one kilo of potato, but you have to give me one kilo of carrots, okay? Or you have to give me back two euros or something like that, okay? So market economy works for what we call it recipro reciprocal economy or symmetrical economy, whereas gift economy, we call it asymmetrical economy. I give something, I help you, my neighbor, to fix your roof, and I know that will save you time to take care of the kids at school, and so on and so on. And other things will come back to me in a different time, and a different content, structure, and so on, okay? So as a social system, a gift economy has much more complexity because it goes from 1% to 1% to 1% and so on, and then it comes back. You give and you receive in a much more complex way. But we could only do that with small communities because of the complexity of that. When we go into a big community, that big community needs to go into pyramidal structure, and then we'll put money in the market symmetrical economy. It simplifies the flow very much, but it puts a very strong barrier that we call the condition of reciprocity. I won't give you this if you don't have something in return. So then it strongly limits the flows. If the person in front of me doesn't have the money or some form of wealth to give in return to solve the thing, to resolve the exchange, then the exchange, the flow won't happen. Whereas in the gift economy, it will very likely happen because I know it can go somewhere, 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 and something else in another time from another person will come back to me, okay? So we know gift economies naturally. We actually practice more the gift economy than the market economy. But we, we do it all the day, and so we don't realize. We do it unconsciously, okay? And the question now that we have, can we make 
Can we scale up? Can we make big gift economies? Not for idealistic reasons, but for very practical reasons, because it works better, because it builds a very different social contract among people. Because gift economy means empathy. It means taking care of one another. It doesn't mean negotiation. In the market economy, I go to you, and I'll negotiate the price with, me, with you, and you'll negotiate with me, and we, we, we call it the market tension that will lead to a final price. Everyone trying to pull on his own interests, and that creates the market tension. And so we, we call it negotiation. But in a gift economy, you don't do negotiation. You deliberate. You want to converge into everyone's interest and the common interest as well. You don't have the same social contract. But that creates lots of social complexity. And so far, with before the internet, we never knew how to make massive, long-term, long lasting gift economies. But now with the internet and with the technologies of social complexity, we know how to build big gift economies. And we have examples of that. You know, Wikipedia, the open source software, couch surfing. You know what couch surfing means, some of you? I mean, I can go anywhere in the world and I will likely find a room a guest room or a sofa, a couch waiting for me where I can sleep and get welcomed by someone. And I can welcome travelers for all over the world. He has no money in it. He has just gift. Okay? And reputation, of course, you know, some ingredients. It has some architecture in it, some conditions. But so we see more and more platforms appearing, some of them in the old market economy paradigm, like Airbnb. You sell a place to someone or uh, like um, uh, Uber, same thing, you sell the, your time and your car to someone. And aside from that, you see massive gift economies that start to rise up, where you offer a ride to someone, when you can offer a tool to share with someone, when you can offer your knowledge to someone, and so on. And it just began. But massive gift economies can only exist in the form of holomidal collective intelligence, not or very unlikely in the form of pyramidal collective intelligence because pyramidal works through market economy, works through scarce currency, has the scarcity paradigm embedded in its worldview. So gift economy has something paradoxical because we live in it every day through family, friends, school, even colleagues, you know, we don't invoice between colleagues, you know, in the company. But then when we go into bigger organization and the bigger society, we shift into market economy and then we start to see the limitations of that. So back to my own life, I decided to go myself in the gift economy for these reasons. First, I wanted to understand this as a system better. And I could only understand it better as a system if I do it myself first, to see how it works. And it also helped me to understand what I would have to do as my inner integral yoga as well. Because when you go to an unknown place, you have to change lots of things, lots of assumptions about yourself. I had to see uh, what fears I have. I had to detect the old habits of thinking market whereas I should think abundance. I had to move from a linear thinking like I need the money to do this and this and this and this, linear thinking, into synchronistic thinking, synchronicities, like I trust, I want this, and I trust that it will happen. I trust that somewhere, someone, some hearts will contribute to support me, and so I can also support others and so on. So it made me move from a mental reality, the market economy based, completely based on the mental and predictions, I need this amount of money, then I can buy this and do this and do that, into a transrational and I guess quite supramental experience where I trust that things will happen and I trust it so much that I surrender my vital because I don't know where I will sleep or where I'll eat the next day. So you put your most vital 
fears your body, your, your life into this kind of thing. And especially if you do it in, in a country that doesn't know about those things, that can trigger even more fears. And I had to face all these fears, but it worked. So it shows that shifting from an architecture, the architecture of conventional money, a linear thinking, into gift economy, not just had consequences, I would say, through wealth, but it has even deeper consequences in my inner psychology, in my inner structure, in my inner profound being. And what I shared with you as examples, remember, um, the breathing, the, um, the uh, E-prime, moving in the gift economy, all these things, I did not do them because of social activism or social idealism. I did them because I saw that shifting this architecture may very likely take me into a new place for consciousness. And as a researcher, then I could observe the link between architecture and consciousness. Sometimes if we design the right conditions, then higher consciousness may emerge. If we don't design the right conditions, lower consciousness may emerge. Why did Aurovillian build the Matrimandir? That architecture serves exactly the purpose of enhancing hi higher consciousness. It doesn't mean I will have a higher consciousness if I go there, but it, it really offers conditions for that. Okay? So architecture has this power. What if we design in our meeting rooms, in our Oville, the right social codes that attract wisdom? What if people start to breathe before speaking? In some way or another, you know, you have many ways to include, include breathing in, in conversations. I, come, I came up with something called the six agreements that we practice in some meeting rooms, but we could do other things. You know, we, knew, we know about talking stick and we, uh, the Quakers in the US have uh, very efficient methods also for moderating and inviting wisdom as well and speak from God, speak from inspiration and all these things. So we have lots of techniques, but they all say the same thing. Build the right architecture and something emergent may happen and some higher consciousness may manifest. And we can do it through social design, through social codes, software design as well, put the right governance software, decision mechanism, share news, build augmented holoptical views of the collective, you know, those kinds of things. We can do it by designing new currency systems and maybe currency systems that will not work anymore in market economies, but that will support gift economies. So you see all these things, we can design them to build higher consciousness. And I think here I speak to the most profound part of the research and the most, for me, according to me, the most fascinating part in my research to see the miracle of sometimes, you know, taking a group of people from the corporate life. They had never done anything about personal development no consciousness whatsoever about the world and so on. And they try this simple architecture of breathing before speaking and inviting silence many times. And they do that for a couple of days. And those people who have never done any personal development, they see themselves having descending wisdom on them and starting to speak things they never thought they had. Discovering things about themselves and about reality and about the world they never thought they had just because the architecture Helped them to do so. It doesn't mean everyone will do that, but on a statistical level it triggers that so as the Rovillians and people committed to evolve evolve individually but we know how we and spiritual traditions have given us a lot and lots of tools to evolve individually but how can we also evolve the collectives that we build, either companies, organizations, or Oroville itself? We need to address those questions about invisible architecture. We want to redesign new social codes. We want to create software code. We want to redesign new currencies. We want to eat differently. 
because also food works exactly the same way. It has invisible architecture. It perpetuates a social order. We want to address the way culture operates in our physical body. And that we will work on that next Sunday. We will see, for instance, that the way we walk, just the way we walk, has a cultural construct in itself. We will see that the way we breathe, we don't breathe naturally. We breathe the way we got taught to breathe. And it has consequences on the way we think, on the kind of consciousness we build inside ourselves. So as people committed to evolution, how far do you want yourself to go in hacking yourself? In hacking yourself. That means take the things that don't belong to you, language, culture, social code, food, software, technologies, money, and all these things, and hack these things so that they, when they come to you, but something different comes out of you. And here we talk about invisible architecture, and we talk about something that spiritual traditions have not addressed yet. Everything has to come in, in, in its own time. Spiritual traditions have not explored the Pareto effect. I know no spiritual tradition that I've explored those kinds of things and how it operates at a collective level. Spiritual traditions have not done neuro-linguistics that show how certain semantic structure will affect our brain and will build new kind of neuronal connections. They had insights, but they never addressed the consequences at a collective level. So we have something very new and a fantastic opportunity for, for, for people in Oroville to integrate what spiritual traditions have built as so much wisdom and what Sri Aurobindo and the mother have built. And they have sensed these things that I talk about. They've seen them, but not with the scientific data that now we have and that I share with you about those you know, constructs and uh, the way our brain works and all these things. So we have evidence now about those things. So you have a choice, very simple choice. Next time you come, you go with your family or your friends or your mates or when you go in a meeting room, do you want, as an example, to commit to breathe before speaking? And even try that for yourself, not impose that on other people. You can just do that by yourself and see what it creates. Just that, as an example, it's an evolutionary example, as a go hack yourself kind of thing. So I'd like to now stop here. I kind of shared different examples and I'd like now to have a more, much more interactive uh, time together. If you have questions, if you have feedback, uh, insights, disagreements, whatever. No, no disagreements, please. <laughs> yeah, disagreements too, if you want. Um, please feel free to, to raise your hand and uh, let's engage. Yes? I have a question about this uh, currency. Uh, yes. The, what kind, how, what does the currency look like that supports the gift economy? Mm. Easy question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me first, um, and we'll go much deeper into that by the way on the 24th, okay? So I'll just kind of make an overview, maybe it may seem a little theoretical, but I don't want to go too far in this now. First, you do want to make, you have to make um, a leap, a, a paradigm shift with the word currency. The word currency means in the new paradigm, something much broader than money. Usually we, confound, we confuse money and currency. Money represents one kind of, of millions of different forms of currencies that we can design. And currencies represent current C, C the current, a language of flows. That means something that sees, that gives a scripture, and an updated scripture, of flows between beings. For instance, in your body, you have many currencies, like your, your hormonal system. It represents some flows, and your body and your organs will adjust their exchange of matter and, and the molecules and all these things, and blood, 
because they have currencies that represent the flow and that can balance themselves. Some currencies serve for exchange, and some of them just uh, acknowledge an amount of something given. So, for instance, if we want to make a gift economy um, Auroville, we may want just to track the flow of what gets given from one person to another. Not to have your name say, you know, you don't need to, you may, we can make it anonymously. But we may feel interested to know that lots of time went into building schools. Oh, maybe we have enough time now done for that. But not so much time got invested or involved to uh, uh, the forest, for instance. So then, if you have this kind of information of where to give or what received some gifts already, then you know where to give. And you can operate in a holoptical way. You see the whole because you see the state of the wealth of the system. You see where the flows go. You currents see. You see the currents, OK? So in the gift economy, you have material and immaterial wealth flowing. And if you can track those things, then the system can see itself and balance itself. You can make yourself informed decisions, just like you make informed decisions in a small community because you see what happens in the small community. You don't need currencies. You already have them in your brain, OK? But now we've built an infrastructure where we have those currencies that track where the carbon goes, where the water goes, where time goes, where gratitude goes, those kinds of things, where thanks go, you know. And if we can see them, then as an informed player in the bigger game, you may know what to do and what not to do. The system may also inform you what you can ask for and what you can't ask for because we have to share with others or we don't have enough resources or things like that. Does that build a little bit on your question? Okay, and we'll go much deeper into that uh, on the 24th, yes. Uh, if we want to build um, a community between three people or more, we need a land to build so, this sorry, community. Sorry, I can't hear you, sorry. Ah, uh, if, we, if we need to build a community between three people, mm -hmm. we need a land to build this uh, structure of this we community. Need a what? We need a what? A land. A land, sorry, yes, sorry. A piece of land. Yes. And um, we need uh, to talk about money uh, before uh, doing anything. And uh, at, at what time do we start this uh, no money uh, thing? This what? This? This thing without any money, just without money? sharing. Mm. So uh, let me put this question in, in more general terms. You talk about the land, but you can talk about any community, OK? And that community that interacts with the current world will need to interact with conventional money, right? That goes inside and outside. But inside the community, you can build whatever kind of currencies that facilitate the flow between the members of this community. Now, you can design a currency that will go for a market-oriented kind of community, I give you if you give me back, or to go into a gift economy kind of uh, community that will inform people where the flow goes so they can balance what they give and what they can ask for, or anything in between also. Does, does, I don't know if it builds on your, on your question. It's just very complex. It's it's need to be very balanced, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But thank you. Okay. As you uh, said about your personal experience how you live with the gift economy. I have two questions. Whether have you ever uh, come across that you give, but 
you don't get directly or uh, from that person or that organization and also that organization has a business and uh, they try to do only business and they want to spend less they make more and in this kind of situation how do you deal with it and also maybe uh, you have experienced you give you give yourself but maybe it comes so much abundantly that it, you couldn't imagine that it would come to you in that way mm -hmm. So sorry, I have, uh, I have to confess I have an issue understanding when it resonates like this, uh, hearing problems, and I can really... Shall I repeat? Uh, I have something called the, the cocktail syndrome. Like I hear the sounds very well, but I, it doesn't build into meaning. So if you could speak very slow, sorry for that. Okay. Or someone repeat for me or whatever. I'm not yeah. a native English speaker, so there, is, there could be some problem. Yes. I will repeat. You give... In gift economy, you give yourself the best that you can. Yes. Wherever it is expected or wherever somebody requests you, you give yourself without calculating how much you give, uh, you get or how much that person or that organization gives to others. Mm -hmm. You give yourself completely and uh, you offer your services. Mm -hmm. But depending upon the attitude of that person or the organization, if they are a business organization, they want to make more profit, they mm -hmm. give less to you or less to others, mm -hmm. but then they want to cherish more. Uh, have you come across and what is your uh, uh, feedback about comment on this? And uh, mm -hmm. have, second question is, when you have given yourself completely, uh, when, sincerely... When comes, sorry, second question? When Speak you, very slow, please. Very, very yeah, slow. You, have, you have given your effort, services, Fully, sincerely. Yes. And then uh, maybe the amount or uh, return that you calculate or expect from that, it comes abundantly even maybe 10 times or 100 times right. more than, because you don't have an expectation, but it comes like that. These yes. are two, uh, am I clear now? Have you experienced this, the abundance? I, I try, uh, sorry, I, f I feel a little bit confused, yes? Uh, you, I, I Please. Can, can yes. I? Can I think I? the microphone doesn't help me at all, okay. actually. The okay. resonance, I, I can't really hear. Yes? I'm hearing Ramana Rai ask you is kind of two questions. Yes. So Oh, okay. Or the other, that you get mm. so much more than you expected and how do you deal with that? And what he said in the first time but not in the second, also, is there other times where you don't get the return immediately? Okay. <laughs> yes, does it, does it speak to your question? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, please forgive me for, for my bad hearing uh, on that. So, uh, with organizations, how it works. Uh, usually CEOs call me. I, I never call them I, because I don't sell anything. I don't have customers, right? I have partners. Now they call, someone calls me and say, uh, hey, uh, Jean-Francois, I've heard it from you, from someone, or I saw your conference or whatever, and we would like you uh, to come to help us uh, uh, enhance our radical innovation, for instance, to really, because we don't innovate so much and we still keep tra trapped in the old paradigm and would like to innovate more. Would you come and help us? First question. Okay. Hmm. Well, before the next five minutes, I will ask the person, what makes you get out of bed in the morning? I ask the person a very personal question. Why does this man or woman who calls me, um, what, why does he or she works? What is it he does it for? And so we very quickly go into a very intimate question about the purpose of life. And then I will very quickly see whether someone wants to call me just to use me and you know, sell more cars, more food, more this, more that. Or if behind the project, someone really wants to, has a purpose. 
Because you see, most companies, when I ask them to talk about themselves, they say, oh, we do cars, or we do yogurts, or we, you know, we do restaurants. Okay, you tell me about what you do. Well, where do you go? What for? Why do you do cars? Why do you do yogurts or cosmetics? And they don't know. They've forgotten where they go, the humanity projects that they had. So I check what kind of connection they have with the purpose in what they do. And very often I find very genuine people who really want to do their best. They may not have such a great connection with a greater purpose, but they try to do their best. So we, we go through the first stage, like they want to improve something. And they, and they have a very strong sense of human beings and governance and things like that. So I say, okay, well, maybe before we go into the long run together, why don't we look at a very short-term project and see how we play together? So, for instance, it would go into a conference. Let's do some kind of you know, half day or workshop with uh, your managers so we can see how, how it works. And once we agree on that, I say, okay, that I will offer it to you. I will offer my time and, and my heart, and I'll support you. And it comes with um, some conditions with that. I don't ask you to give me in return. I ask first that we agree that we go for mutual support as human beings. I don't care about the company. I care about human beings. The second thing, whatever we do, we do open source. If we do a conference, we put it on the net. If we create new things in R&D, we make it open innovation. The third thing, you perpetuate the chain of generosity. You ask something for someone, you, you'll have it, and you offer it forward. You can offer it forward to me, or to someone else, or an NGO, or whatever of your choice, when you decide how much and how you decide. I will help you think about it, but I want it to come from your heart, not from a depth. So I kind of name those different steps with, uh, with the people, and that has an amazing efficiency. Because along the steps, well, first, we build a human contract first, mutual support. And all the leaders that I work with today a good number of them, I've known them for years in other organizations, but we keep working together as human beings, as partners, as life partners, okay? And we do only things that have a purpose for evolving human organizations. So now if we go into a longer term, like radical innovation, we'll talk about those kind of innovation that embed some social innovation in them. You know, very interesting things like moving from pyramidal to holomidal with them. Create something out of the conventional pyramidal structure, create something aside, and let's go for this one and see how we'll, people will migrate from the old one to the, to the new one. So we do this kind of things. Now, in regards to the material wealth, how does it work? So sometimes people say, okay, we want to give to this person or this project, and I say, good, go for it. And I feel really happy for that. In most cases, they say, hey, Jeff, we like what you do, and we would like to offer you something. What can we offer you? And I send them to a web page called Desired Riches. Desired Riches. And it says, OK, you can give me money, or you can help me pay for my apartment, or you can give money for the school of my son. I mean, just a list of things, and not just vital things, not just food to survive. Because one of the things I made myself clear with I don't want to go in the gift economy to survive. Gift economy serves for thriving, not for surviving, for thriving, for giving our, each other more than in, in the market economy, and more in depth and more in quantity and quality, both. So, and as a result, I find some uh, persons becoming extremely generous because they see the bigger picture of that. So they just don't want to support me as a person like, you know, JF's needs. And I don't have needs, I have desires, I make it very clear. But they see, okay, huh, helping this thing and, and taking the, the challenge that we can go generous makes them happy to go there. And then they learn that the more you give, 
And the more power you build inside yourself because you learn how to trust. And we know that from people who don't have much money and they invite you in the house and they give you a meal and everything they have because they've learned how to trust. They know that. More than people who have big money. But some people like that learn this. But I have also other experiences as well. <laughs> and mostly it, it happened at the beginning. Something that we call the, um, the noodle necklace. Noodle necklace. And just kind of private joke. As a, one of the first things I, I, I made for my mom for Mother's Day, I took some noodles <laughs> and made an absolutely horrible <laughs> kind of necklace <laughs> to her. Really awful, just with noodles. But I got so proud of what I did. <laughs> and I did my best for her. And I see some companies who give very little because of their entanglement in their scarcity model. Or like you've worked with this group of people, but then on the other side of the company, you have this accountant or this finance service, and they say, what? I mean, we, we don't do these things, and we don't want to know about these things. So, and we'll try to pay something as low as possible, and those things happen sometimes. I say, okay, no big deal. So it, it works on, on both, but I, I really see mostly the, I, I have now a collection of amazing experiences because most of my time the past five years I, I didn't have a visibility like a financial visibility more than a week or two sometimes like really living day by day but everything that needed to happen happened and so I really experienced I really placed my uh, vital being in the hands of synchronicity most people have, you know, they kind of vital, kind of safe, or they have the illusion of safety, like I have my salary and all these things. But, and then they experience synchronicity aside from that, you know, important moments. But really put all your life into this makes a huge difference. And I have many stories about that. Yeah. My pleasure. Yes? Yeah. Do you have a wife and children? And what did that say? <laughs> You mean, do I own them? Okay. Do you understand my question? I think I do. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so I have a 15 years old boy. He came here by the way and spent three weeks. He came back to France um, a week ago now. Um, and his mother and I live separated and, but in a very, very good uh, relationship, so yes. And um, I guess the question connected to that, <laughs> do you want to state it? <laughs> no, it was uh, related to what you said yes. before about trust and the yes. sometimes you had just one week Right. So yes, the, the most challenging part comes from the, your children, of course. Whatever choice you make in life, you think about your children before yourself. I mean, making a decision for yourself feels easy compared to the ones that you know it will have an impact on your, on your children. But something that made a big difference for, for me came the day when I realized that I don't make any gift to my child if I show him a sacrificial father, if I show him a, a dad that goes for his being, then I invite him to go to his own being and not reproduce the utilitarian, sacrificial, parental thing for kids. You look how I screwed up my life for you. Oh, and by the way, you'll do the same for your, your kids, right? Does it ring a bell? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so I, I didn't want to go there. So, I accepted that it could have many risks and it would impact him, yes. Just like people who fight for human rights or you know the, those things that can really have a very strong impact and some people die for it. And it create, can create huge impact and even loss. But I do believe on a deeper level that children when they grow up, they've learned something even more precious than the life of their parents. I, I believe in that. 
maybe people can disagree with that, but I have this uh, assumption for myself. Yeah. Yes? No, I said someone else. <laughs> OK. <laughs> mm. OK, well, first, look, just observe the language you used, how conditioned you, because you used pay for a service. And they don't pay me for service whatsoever. You know, even if they give nothing or... So I, I really make a point about the clarity of language that we need to build, and it took me quite some time. And part of the coaching that I give them, you know, when they say, hey, JF, how can we reward you or pay you? I say, no, you don't pay me. You may gift me with something if you want, if you want to do it to me. But you see, I always insist on language to have a very precise language for a gift economy. Now, that said, if I have this feeling, I will tell them. I will tell them not about the enough or not enough I will explore what kind of process did they went through, did they go through in, in what they gave. And mostly, they can acknowledge that they went into a scarcity process, that they went into something unconscious, that they kind of negotiated something inside. And if they can recognize that, then we can, we can see, OK, how can we do better next time? And you don't have to give to me. I really make that very straight. If you won't give to others, so I can keep the, the absolute guarantee that I don't do it for my, you know, just personal interest. I really invite them to, to decide what they want to do. Otherwise, I could not have an honest uh, discourse uh, with them. So in order to, to keep that level of honesty, they know that they can give to anyone else, and it happens, and I feel really happy when it happens. Or sometimes they do half off or things like that. Yes. My pleasure. Yes? Did it ever happen that a company gave up something nothing? That a company gave nothing. Nothing. Or yes. yes, it has happened. And um, I learned a lesson from that each time, because each time I knew it up front. When I look back, I knew it. And I did not integrate those weak signals, in, uh, or I did not go with enough rigor about their process. And in most cases, it doesn't come from a bad individual. It comes from a collective process. And the unconscious flows in the collective. Again, we go into, uh, you see the collective. You can have a sum of very nice person in front of you, and collectively, they won't deliver. Yeah. Right. Yes? Hmm. So actually, I apply the gift economy for everything. I, I made, because people ask me so many times, how do you survive? So they, they think that gift economy means the hat with the little coins in it, you know? And I wanted to make clear that gift economy means we give the best and the most to one another. And when I give to my time to people, I make sure I, I give the most of myself to the limit of my balance. Of course, you don't want to exhaust yourself and, uh, or to, to offer things that people have not asked you. Um, so in that uh, desired riches page, you will see along together things about food and things about a piano, for instance. Or last summer, I had this long time dream I wanted to do paragliding. And last summer, I really put that as my dream, and I want this summer to learn how to do paragliding. 
And it just happened. A company said, hey, we saw that you want wings. We want to offer you those wings. And they offered the wings and they offered the class and now I can I, I fly because of that. So I have so many big stories uh, like that. And it doesn't say anything about survival. So now for the survival part, I mean the vital part, it has happened many, many times that some days I didn't have any clue how I would go to the market the next day. I really had absolutely nothing in my pocket. And it has happened a countless number of times. And every time something has happened. Just really mind-blowing to, to, to see that. But I have to practice this inner joy and inner trust. If I start to victimize myself, like, oh my God, you know, and poor me, and uh, I feel tired and all these things, not so good. So I really have to go inside myself again and actually feel okay with not eating, actually feeling okay if I don't have my apartment anymore, you know, those things. Just to know, okay, not a big deal, actually. I can end up in the streets. I may not eat. Okay. And I feel totally okay even to die. I have to, to, to connect to my peace about that. And only because of this condition of having no fear to let go, then things happen. But if I, if I operate from fear, and I start to build, to put the need in the relationship, the neediness, and that will start slightly to create an imbalance of dependency of one person to another, rather than equanimity between, uh, between two persons. So I have to, to really play very sharp here and uh, become very vigilant about myself. Does that build on your question? Yeah. My pleasure. I guess we're coming to an end for today. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for you, Jean-Francois, for the rest of the group? So you can continue next Sunday. We start at nine o'clock and I would like to say we had yesterday from the council our, our first meeting where we went into the body. And it was so much fun with steps. So we it cre created connection between us. We could see where our own blockages are. It was just, I found my inner child and I hope we are taking this experience in our meetings. It, it really changed the dynamic between us and it was so Great. And the time went by so fast. So we were supposed to do it two hours. We ended up to do it three hours. And nobody was bored. So just come on Sunday and enjoy the continuation. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, Jean-Francois. My pleasure. And uh, I invite you now to help to bring the chairs and cushions back. So, yeah, before I think also we should have a minute of silence. Okay. Yeah. One last thing about Sunday. Come with uh, clothes for moving. Okay? Uh, yeah, yes. come with comfortable clothes, yeah. Right. So, one minute of silence. You drive it. <laughs>